My name is Jebediah Jeb Conway, and this happened to me on August 14, 1987. I was hauling a load of lumber from a mill in Oregon down to a construction site in Nevada. I've been a trucker for almost 20 years now, seen a lot of weird stuff on the road, but nothing like this. Buckle up. This is going to be a wild ride. The route I was taking was a lesser-known highway, the kind of road only truckers and locals knew about. It cut through miles of dense forest, winding and narrow, but it shaved a good two hours off my trip. I was making good time and decided to pull over at a small truck stop near the Nevada border. It was one of those places you'd miss if you blinked. Just a diner, a gas pump, and a few parking spaces. Inside the diner, the waitress, a middle-aged woman with frizzy hair named Linda, poured me a coffee. There was a couple of other truckers in there, but the place was pretty dead. You're new here, she said, her voice raspy from too many cigarettes. Just passing through, I replied, taking a sip of the surprisingly good coffee. Linda leaned in a little, her eyes narrowing. You be careful on that road, honey. Not everyone makes it through there. I chuckled. What, you got bears or something? She didn't laugh. Just be careful. I finished my meal and paid the bill, leaving a decent tip for Linda. Back in my truck, I felt a little uneasy, but I chalked it up to Linda's weird warning. I started the engine and got back on the road. It was getting dark, and the forest seemed to close in around me as I drove deeper into the middle of nowhere. The only sound was the hum of my tires on the pavement and the occasional rustle of branches in the wind. About an hour into the drive, I saw something up ahead. A car with its hazard lights on, pulled over to the side. I slowed down and rolled down my window. You need help? I called out. A man emerged from the shadows. He looked to be in his thirties, dressed in a plaid shirt and jeans, his face shadowed by a baseball cap. Yeah, my car broke down. Can you give me a lift to the next town? I hesitated for a moment. Something about the guy seemed off, but it was late and he looked desperate. All right, hop in, I said. He climbed into the passenger seat and we got back on the road. Name's Rick, he said, extending a hand. Jeb, I replied, shaking his hand. It was clammy and cold. We drove in silence for a while. Rick kept fidgeting, glancing around nervously. I tried to make small talk, but he just gave me one-word answers. After a few miles... I noticed he was staring at the glove compartment. You got a gun in there? He asked suddenly. I shook my head. Nope. Don't believe in carrying one. Rick nodded, but I could see the gears turning in his head. I decided to keep an eye on him. Something wasn't right. As we rounded a bend, the road ahead was blocked by a fallen tree. I cursed under my breath and stopped the truck. Looks like we're walking, I said reaching for the flashlight I kept under the seat. Rick didn't move. You go ahead. I'll wait here. I narrowed my eyes at him. In the dark? What are you afraid of? He didn't answer, just stared straight ahead. I grabbed the flashlight and stepped out of the truck, leaving the door open. As I walked towards the fallen tree, I heard Rick's door open and close. I turned around, the flashlight beam catching him as he sprinted into the woods. What the hell? I muttered, more to myself than anyone else. I had half a mind to leave him there, but something told me to follow. I walked into the woods, the flashlight beam cutting through the darkness. The trees were dense, their branches creating eerie shapes in the dim light. I could hear Rick crashing through the underbrush ahead of me. Rick, I called out. Where the hell are you going? No answer. I kept walking my senses on high alert. After a few minutes, I found a clearing with an old dilapidated cabin in the center. The door was ajar, and I could see a faint light flickering inside. I approached cautiously, my heart pounding in my chest. I pushed the door open and stepped inside. The cabin was small, just one room with a table, a couple of chairs, and a bed in the corner. A single lantern cast a dim light, casting long shadows on the walls. And there, sitting at the table, was Rick. But he wasn't alone. Across from him was another man, older, 
with a grizzled beard and a cold, dead look in his eyes. Well, well, the older man said, his voice dripping with menace. Look what we have here. I backed towards the door, but the older man stood up, blocking my escape. You're not going anywhere, friend. I glanced at Rick, who looked like he was about to bolt again. What's going on here? I demanded. The older man chuckled. Just a little business transaction. Rick here owes me, and you're going to help him pay up. Before I could react, the older man lunged at me, a knife flashing in his hand. I managed to dodge, the blade grazing my arm. I grabbed a chair and swung it at him, connecting with a satisfying thud. He staggered back, but didn't go down. Rick took that moment to make a run for it, darting out the door. I didn't have time to chase him. The older man recovered quickly, slashing at me again. I kicked the table towards him, buying myself a few precious seconds. I needed a weapon, something to even the odds. My eyes darted around the room, landing on an old hunting rifle mounted on the wall. I made a break for it, ripping it off the wall just as the older man charged at me. I swung the rifle like a club, catching him in the side. He went down, but I knew he wouldn't stay down for long. I checked the rifle. It was loaded. I aimed it at the older man, my hands shaking. Stay down, I warned. He laughed, a harsh guttural sound. You don't have the guts. I pulled the trigger. The sound was deafening in the small cabin. The older man collapsed, blood pooling around him. I stood there, breathing hard, the rifle still aimed at his lifeless body. Rick was gone, but I didn't care. I needed to get out of there. I left the cabin, making my way back to the truck. The fallen tree was still there, but I didn't care. I climbed back into the cab and locked the doors, my hands still shaking. I sat there for a long time, trying to process what had just happened. Eventually, I called the police, telling them about the cabin and the man I had shot. They arrived a couple of hours later, and I led them back to the cabin. They found the body, just as I had described. But there was no sign of Rick. They searched the woods, but he was long gone. The police took my statement and let me go. They ruled it self-defense, but that didn't make me feel any better. I got back in my truck and drove away, leaving the nightmare behind. I finished my delivery in Nevada and headed back home. I couldn't shake the feeling that Rick was still out there somewhere. Every time I passed a broken down car or saw someone hitchhiking, I thought of him. It's been years since that night, but it still haunts me. I've seen a lot of things on the road, but nothing like that. And I hope I never do again. So if you ever find yourself driving down a lonely highway and see a stranded driver, think twice before you stop. You never know what kind of trouble you might be inviting into your life. My name is Quentin Boyd, and this happened to me on September 17, 2004. I was driving my rig through a part of Oregon that you probably haven't heard of, a town called Burns. It's the kind of place where people keep to themselves and you might not see a soul for miles. I was hauling a load of lumber to Boise, taking a route that wasn't my usual. But a storm had closed the main highway, and dispatch had sent me on this detour. I've been trucking for nearly 20 years, and I'm used to the long, lonely stretches of road. The cab of my truck is like a second home, complete with a small fridge, a bunk, and a collection of old cassettes. I was listening to a Johnny Cash tape trying to stay awake and alert. The rain was coming down hard and the wipers were working overtime. The headlights cut through the darkness, but visibility was still lousy. About an hour out of Burns, the engine started to sputter. At first, I thought it was just the rough road, but then it cut out completely. I coasted to the side of the road, cursing under my breath. This wasn't the first time my rig had given me trouble, but it was the worst possible timing. I grabbed my flashlight and popped the hood, hoping it was something simple I could fix. I'm no mechanic, but I know my way around an engine well enough to keep it running. This time, though, I couldn't figure out what was wrong. Everything looked fine, but it just wouldn't start. I tried the radio to call for help, but there was nothing but static. 
I was about to get back in the cab and wait for a passing car when I saw a light in the distance. It was a small house set back from the road. There was no driveway or path leading to it, just an overgrown field. I decided to hike over and see if I could use their phone. I grabbed my jacket and started walking, the rain soaking me to the bone. The light in the house was faint, but steady, a small beacon in the middle of nowhere. As I got closer, I noticed how run down the place looked. The paint was peeling, and the windows were dirty and cracked. Still, I was desperate. I knocked on the door and waited. No answer. I knocked again, louder this time. Finally, I heard footsteps and the door creaked open a few inches. An old man peered out at me, his face mostly hidden in the shadows. He had wild gray hair and a beard that looked like it hadn't been trimmed in years. What do you want? He asked, his voice gruff. My truck broke down, I said, trying to keep my voice steady. I need to use a phone. The old man stared at me for a long moment before he nodded and opened the door wider. Come in, he said, stepping aside. I hesitated for a second, then walked in. The inside of the house was even more run down than the outside. The air was musty and the only light came from a few dim lamps. The furniture was old and mismatched, and there were stacks of newspapers and magazines everywhere. Phones in the kitchen, the old man said, pointing to a doorway. I thanked him and headed that way but something about the place was giving me the creeps. I tried to shake it off, telling myself I was just tired and wet. The kitchen was cluttered and dirty, but I found the phone on the wall. I picked it up and listened for a dial tone. Nothing. I jiggled the cradle and tried again. Still nothing. It's dead, the old man said from the doorway. Hasn't worked in years. I turned to him, feeling a knot of frustration in my chest. Do you have a cell phone? He shook his head. No signal out here. I sighed, rubbing my temples. Is there anyone else around? A neighbor with a working phone? The old man shook his head again. Closest neighbor is five miles down the road. You're welcome to stay here until morning, then you can walk it. I didn't like the idea of staying in that house, but I didn't have much choice. I nodded and thanked him. He showed me to a small room with a cot and a single dusty window. You can sleep here, he said. I'll bring you some blankets. Thanks, I said, forcing a smile. The old man left and I sat down on the cot. The room was cold and damp, and I could hear the rain beating against the window. I took off my wet jacket and boots, then lay down, hoping to get some rest. I must have drifted off because I woke up to the sound of something moving outside. I sat up, straining to listen. It was faint, but it sounded like footsteps crunching on gravel. I got up and went to the window, but I couldn't see anything in the darkness. My gut told me something was wrong. I decided to grab my flashlight and check it out. I crept down the hall, trying to be as quiet as possible. The house was silent except for the rain. When I reached the front door, I paused and listened again. The footsteps had stopped. I opened the door and stepped outside, the cold air hitting me like a slap. I shined my flashlight around, but there was no one there, just the empty road and the rain. I was about to go back inside when I heard it again, the footsteps, this time coming from the side of the house. I followed the sound, my heart pounding in my chest. When I rounded the corner, I saw a figure standing by the edge of the field. It was the old man and he was dragging something heavy through the mud. "'What are you doing?' I called out, my voice shaky. The old man stopped and turned to me, his eyes wide. For a moment, neither of us moved. Then he dropped whatever he was holding and ran towards me. I stumbled back, my flashlight slipping from my hand. Before I could react, he tackled me to the ground. We struggled in the mud, his hands around my throat. I fought back, kicking and punching, but he was surprisingly strong. Somehow, I managed to break free and scramble to my feet. I grabbed the flashlight and swung it at him, hitting him in the head. He fell back, clutching his skull. I didn't wait to see if he was okay. I ran back to the house and slammed the door behind me, locking it. My mind was racing. What the hell was that old man doing out there? And what was he dragging? I remembered the thing he dropped and decided I had to see what it was. 
I grabbed a knife from the kitchen and went back outside, keeping my eyes peeled for any sign of the old man. When I reached the spot where he'd been, I shined the flashlight on the ground. My blood ran cold. It was a body, wrapped in a tarp. I could see a hand sticking out, pale and lifeless. I backed away, feeling sick. I had to get out of there, but my truck was dead, and there was no one around for miles. I heard a noise behind me and turned to see the old man, blood running down his face. He had a gun pointed at me. Shouldn't have come out here, he said, his voice calm. Should have stayed in your truck. I raised my hands, trying to stay calm. Look, I don't want any trouble. I just want to leave. He shook his head. Can't let you do that. He pulled the trigger. The shot rang out, and I felt a searing pain in my side. I dropped to the ground, clutching the wound. The old man walked over and stood above me, the gun still aimed at my head. Why are you doing this? I gasped, struggling to breathe. He didn't answer. Instead, he raised the gun again. Just as he was about to fire, there was a shout from the road. A car had pulled up, and a man was getting out. The old man turned, distracted, and I took my chance. I grabbed the knife and lunged at him, stabbing him in the leg. He cried out and fell, dropping the gun. The man from the car ran over and grabbed the gun, pointing it at the old man. Don't move, he shouted. I lay back, panting and bleeding. The man called for help on his cell phone, and within minutes, the police and an ambulance arrived. They took the old man away in handcuffs and rushed me to the hospital. I found out later that the old man was a drifter, living in that abandoned house for years. He had a history of violence and had been on the run for a long time. The body in the tarp was another trucker who had broken down on the same road a few days earlier. I was lucky to be alive. I still drive that route sometimes, but I never take the back roads anymore. And I always make sure my rig is in top shape before I hit the road. You never know what kind of trouble you might run into out there. So that's my story. It's not something I like to talk about, but I figured you'd appreciate the warning. Always be careful who you trust and never take a stranger's kindness for granted. You never know what they might be hiding. My name is Neil Grayson, and this happened to me on August 15, 1996. I've been driving trucks for over 20 years now, crisscrossing the country from coast to coast. That night, I was headed to a small town in Missouri to drop off a load of auto parts. The route was familiar, but what happened that night was anything but. I had just refueled at a truck stop off I-44, grabbed a cup of coffee, and a greasy burger that would keep me going till I hit my destination. I chatted briefly with a fellow driver, Rick, who was headed in the opposite direction. We swapped the usual banter about the lousy food, the weather, and the ever-present DOT checks. Stay safe out there, Rick said, climbing back into his rig. I nodded, waved, and headed back to my own truck, a sturdy Kenworth I'd nicknamed Betsy. Little did I know, safe was the last thing I'd be that night. The first sign of trouble came about 50 miles out of the truck stop. I was driving through a remote stretch of highway when I noticed a pair of headlights in my rear view mirror. Nothing unusual about that, except they were getting closer, fast. Before I knew it, the car was right on my bumper, flashing its high beams. I figured it was some hothead in a hurry, so I tapped my brakes lightly to signal him to back off. Instead, the car swerved to the side and accelerated, passing me on the left. As it did, I got a good look at the driver, a man with wild, dark eyes and a twisted grin. He seemed to lock eyes with me for a split second before speeding ahead and disappearing into the night. Shaking off the encounter, I focused back on the road. It was common enough to run into aggressive drivers, especially on these lonely stretches. Still, there was something unsettling about the guy's look but I shrugged it off and turned up the radio, trying to lose myself in some classic rock. About an hour later, I saw the same car again, this time pulled over on the side of the road. The hood was up, and the driver was nowhere in sight. I should have kept going, but something made me slow down. 
Maybe it was curiosity or that nagging feeling that something was off. Either way, I decided to stop and check it out. I pulled Betsy over and grabbed my flashlight before stepping out into the humid night. The air was thick with the scent of pine and the distant hum of cicadas. As I approached the car, I called out, Hey, you need some help? No response. Cautiously, I walked around to the front of the car. The engine was still running, but there was no one in sight. I felt a prickling at the back of my neck. Turning back toward my truck, I nearly jumped out of my skin when I saw the driver standing there right beside Betsy. He was tall, lanky, and now that I could see him up close, his eyes were even more unsettling. They had a wild, almost feral glint to them. Everything all right, man? I asked, trying to keep my voice steady. He didn't reply. Instead, he reached into his jacket and pulled out a knife. My heart skipped a beat. This was bad. Real bad. Whoa, hey, no need for that, I said, backing away slowly. I'm just trying to help. He started walking towards me, knife glinting in the moonlight. My mind raced, trying to think of what to do. Running wasn't an option. He'd catch me in seconds. I needed to get back to Betsy, where I had a tire iron under the seat. I turned and bolted for my truck, hearing his footsteps pounding behind me. I reached Betsy and yanked the door open, scrambling inside just as the knife slammed into the metal doorframe. I grabbed the tire iron and swung it around, catching him in the arm. He let out a grunt and stumbled back, clutching his arm. I didn't waste any time. I threw Betsy into gear and floored it, leaving the man and his broken-down car behind. My heart was pounding, adrenaline surging through my veins. I drove for what felt like hours, not daring to slow down or look back. Finally, I saw the lights of a small diner up ahead. I pulled into the parking lot, shaking and covered in sweat. Inside, the place was nearly empty, just a couple of truckers and the waitress behind the counter. I stumbled in, probably looking like I'd seen a ghost. The waitress, a kind-looking woman in her forties, approached me. You all right, hun? You look like you've been through hell. I nodded, trying to catch my breath. I just... I need to call the cops. There's a guy out there. He tried to kill me. She didn't ask any more questions, just handed me the phone. I called the local sheriff's office and told them everything. They said they'd send someone out to meet me at the diner. While I waited, I ordered a cup of coffee, my hands still trembling as I lifted it to my lips. The other truckers gave me curious glances but didn't say anything. Truck drivers see all kinds of things on the road, but what I'd just experienced was beyond the usual. It wasn't long before a couple of deputies showed up. I recounted the whole story to them, every detail I could remember about the man and his car. They took notes and promised to search the area. You did the right thing, Neil, one of the deputies said, clapping me on the shoulder. We'll find this guy. I nodded, though I wasn't entirely convinced. That look in the man's eyes was something I'd never forget. It haunted me the whole rest of my trip, and for weeks after. A few days later I got a call from the sheriff's office. They'd found the car abandoned on a side road, but there was no sign of the driver. It was like he'd vanished into thin air. They asked me to come down to the station to look at some mugshots, but none of them matched the man I'd seen. Life went on as it does. I kept driving, though I was more cautious always checking my mirrors and keeping my doors locked. The memory of that night stayed with me, a constant reminder of how quickly things can go wrong. A month later, I was back at that same truck stop on I-44. As I refueled, I saw Rick again. We exchanged nods and he walked over. Heard you had some trouble a while back, he said, lighting a cigarette. Word gets around. Yeah, I said, trying to keep it light. Some nut job with a knife. Never found him. Rick shook his head. Damn, that's rough. You be careful out there, Neil. A lot of crazies on the road. I will, I promised, though I knew it was easier said than done. Months turned into years, and the incident became a story I'd tell over coffee at truck stops. A cautionary tale for new drivers. But deep down, I always wondered what happened to that man. Where he went. 
and if he ever tried to pull the same stunt on someone else. One night, about five years later, I got my answer. I was parked at a rest area in Tennessee, half asleep in my cab, when I heard a knock on my window. I jolted awake, heart racing. I peered out and saw a familiar face. Rick. Rick, what the hell? You scared the crap out of me, I said, opening the door. Sorry, Neil, but you gotta hear this, he said, his voice low and urgent. Remember that guy who tried to knife you? Yeah, how could I forget? They caught him, down in Texas. Same M.O., broken down car, tried to stab a driver. Only this time, the driver had a gun. My breath caught. Is he... Dead, Rick said, nodding. Driver shot him in self-defense. Cops ID'd him as a drifter with a long rap sheet. Figured you'd want to know. I sat back, processing the news. Relief washed over me, but so did a strange sense of closure. The man who'd haunted my nightmares was finally gone. Thanks, Rick. I appreciate it. Stay safe, Neil, he said, heading back to his truck. As I watched him go... I felt a weight lift off my shoulders. The road ahead felt a little less dangerous, a little more familiar. And though I knew there would always be risks, I also knew I could handle them. Because out there on the open road, you never know what's coming. But you keep going, one mile at a time. My name is Clyde Jessup and this happened to me on June 15th, 1993. I was a truck driver back then, hauling goods across the country. That summer, I had a route that took me through the quiet back roads of West Virginia, a place where the mountains rolled like an endless wave and the trees seemed to swallow the road whole. I was a simple guy, living out of my cab most days, enjoying the solitude and the open road. That particular run had me carrying a load of industrial supplies from Pittsburgh down to Charleston. It wasn't anything special, just another job. I remember the day clearly because it was hotter than hell, and my truck's AC was on the fritz. I was somewhere near Elkins, a small town nestled in the Monongahela National Forest. I'd been driving for hours, the sweat sticking my shirt to my back, when I decided to pull over at a rest stop to stretch my legs and grab a soda. The place was deserted, save for an old beat-up sedan parked at the far end. It was the kind of spot you'd expect to see a family picnicking, but there wasn't a soul around. I climbed out of the cab, my boots crunching on the gravel, and headed towards the vending machine. As I reached into my pocket for some change, I heard a noise coming from the direction of the sedan. It was a faint thumping like someone banging on a door. I glanced over squinting against the sun, but I couldn't see anyone. My curiosity got the better of me, so I walked towards the car. When I got closer, I saw the car was in rough shape. The paint was peeling, and the windows were grimy with dust. But what caught my eye was the trunk. It was slightly ajar, and the thumping was louder now. I hesitated for a moment, wondering if I should mind my own business, but then I thought about what might happen if someone was in trouble and I did nothing. I approached the trunk cautiously and gave it a gentle push. It creaked open, revealing a sight that made my stomach churn. Inside was a woman, bound and gagged, her eyes wide with terror. She thrashed against her restraints, trying to scream through the cloth in her mouth. "'Holy hell!' I exclaimed, fumbling with the ropes that tied her wrists and ankles. "'Hang on, I'll get you out of here.' She was in bad shape, bruises covering her arms and face, but she managed to nod weakly. It took me a minute to get her free, and once I did, she practically collapsed into my arms. I helped her over to my truck and got her settled in the passenger seat, grabbing a bottle of water from the cooler behind my seat. "'Who did this to you?' I asked, handing her the water. She drank greedily, coughing between gulps. "'I sp I don't know.' She stammered. He grabbed me while I was walking to my car, knocked me out. Next thing I knew I was in that trunk. I looked around, my senses on high alert. We need to get you to a hospital, or the police. No, she said, her voice urgent. He's still out there. He'll come after us. 
I didn't need any more convincing. I fired up the engine and pulled out of the rest stop, my eyes darting to the rearview mirror every few seconds. We drove in silence for a while, the tension thick in the cab. I kept the speed steady, not wanting to attract any attention, but my heart was racing. What's your name? I asked after a while. Laura, she replied, her voice trembling. Laura Weston. All right, Laura. I'm Clyde. We're going to get you some help, okay? Just hang in there. She nodded, but I could see the fear in her eyes. I didn't blame her. Whoever had done this was still out there, and we were racing against time. I decided to head for the nearest town, hoping to find a police station or a hospital. We reached Elkins in about twenty minutes, and I pulled into a gas station to ask for directions. The clerk, a young guy with a mullet and a name tag that read Randy, gave me a curious look when I asked about the police station. Just a couple blocks down, he said, pointing to the south. Take a left at the light, and you'll see it. Thanks, I said tossing a few bucks on the counter for a pack of smokes. Appreciate it. I got back in the truck and followed Randy's directions. We found the station easily enough. A small brick building with a single squad car parked out front. I parked the truck and helped Laura out, her legs still shaky from the ordeal. Inside, the place was quiet. A bored-looking officer sat behind the desk, flipping through a magazine. He looked up as we entered, his eyes narrowing as he took in Laura's condition. Can I help you folks? He asked, setting the magazine aside. This woman needs help, I said. She was kidnapped and stuffed in the trunk of a car back at a rest stop. The officer's demeanor changed instantly. He stood up, grabbing a radio from the desk. Ma'am, please have a seat. We'll get you some medical attention and take your statement. He called for backup and an ambulance, and within minutes... The station was buzzing with activity. Paramedics arrived and began tending to Laura while the officer took my statement. I recounted everything that had happened, from finding Laura to bringing her here. Did you see anyone else at the rest stop? He asked. No, just the car, I replied. Whoever did this is still out there. The officer nodded, scribbling in his notepad. We'll send a unit out to investigate. Thank you for your help, Mr. Jessup. Laura was taken to the local hospital, and I was left standing outside the station, feeling a mix of relief and unease. I lit a cigarette and leaned against the truck, watching the sun dip below the horizon. It had been one hell of a day, and I couldn't shake the feeling that it wasn't over yet. A couple of days passed, and I couldn't stop thinking about Laura. I called the hospital to check on her, but they wouldn't give me any information. Privacy laws, they said. It made sense, but it was frustrating. I wanted to know she was okay. I decided to stay in Elkins for a bit, parked my truck at a nearby motel, and waited for news. One evening, as I was sitting in the diner nursing a cup of coffee, a man walked in and sat down at the counter. He was tall, with a wiry frame and a face that looked like it had seen too many bar fights. There was something about him that set off alarm bells in my head. I watched him out of the corner of my eye as he ordered a burger and a beer. He didn't seem to notice me, but I couldn't shake the feeling that he was dangerous. Maybe it was paranoia, or maybe it was intuition. Either way, I decided to keep an eye on him. He finished his meal and left the diner, heading towards the parking lot. I tossed a few bills on the table and followed him outside, keeping a safe distance. He walked to a car that looked familiar, the same beat-up sedan I'd seen at the rest stop. My heart pounded in my chest as I ducked behind a nearby truck, watching him from the shadows. He opened the trunk and rummaged around, pulling out a roll of duct tape and a length of rope. It was him. It had to be. I fumbled for my phone and dialed 911, my hands shaking. I gave the operator my location and a description of the man, urging them to hurry. I watched as he closed the trunk and got into the car, my mind racing. I couldn't let him get away. I had a wrench in my truck, something I used for maintenance on the road. Without thinking, I grabbed it and approached the sedan. The guy was just starting the engine when I yanked open the driver's door and swung the wrench at his head. It connected with a sickening thud, 
and he slumped over the wheel. Panting, I stepped back, the wrench slipping from my grasp. I hadn't killed him, at least I didn't think so. But he was out cold. The sound of sirens filled the air, and within minutes, the police arrived, guns drawn. They cuffed the guy and took him away, and I gave my statement for the second time in as many days. It turned out he was a drifter, with a record of assaults and kidnappings across several states. Laura was lucky to be alive, and the police assured me she would be well protected from now on. As for me, I finished my run to Charleston and went back to my usual routes. Life on the road had always been unpredictable, but that summer, it took on a whole new meaning. I never saw Laura again, but I hoped she found some peace after what she'd been through. I still think about her sometimes, especially on those long, lonely drives through the mountains. It's funny how one moment can change everything. That day in West Virginia reminded me that you never know what's around the next bend. Sometimes, it's a beautiful view. Other times, it's something much darker. But you keep driving, because that's all you can do. My name is Dwight Patton, and this happened to me on July 23, 1999. I was a truck driver back then, hauling goods up and down the East Coast. The job was mostly uneventful. Long hours behind the wheel, plenty of greasy diner food, and nights spent in the cab of my truck at rest stops. But this one trip, it's one I'll never forget. I was driving through West Virginia, a stretch of road I knew well but didn't particularly like. It was late, around 11 p.m., and the night was thick and heavy with humidity. I was heading toward a small town called Marlinton, planning to drop off a load of construction supplies. My route took me through some pretty remote areas, not the kind of places you want to break down. I'd been on the road for about 12 hours straight and was starting to feel the weight of it. My eyes felt gritty and my hands ached from gripping the wheel. I figured I'd pull over soon to catch some sleep, but I wanted to make a little more progress first. That's when I saw the sign for a rest area about five miles ahead. Seemed like a good spot to stop. The rest area wasn't much, just a couple of picnic tables and a grimy restroom, but it was quiet. I pulled in, parked the truck, and stepped out to stretch my legs. The place was deserted, not a single car in sight. The only sound was the low hum of the insects buzzing in the night. After a few minutes of stretching, I decided to use the restroom. The door creaked loudly as I pushed it open, and the inside smelled like old urine and cleaning chemicals. I did my business quickly, eager to get back to the truck and settle in for the night. As I was walking back, I noticed something strange. There was a car parked a little ways down a beat-up old sedan that looked like it hadn't moved in years. I hadn't seen it when I pulled in, but I didn't think much of it. Maybe it was just abandoned. I climbed back into the cab, locked the doors, and pulled the curtains closed. I was just about to drift off when I heard it, a soft tapping on the window. My heart jumped into my throat. I sat up, peering through the curtain, but couldn't see anything in the darkness. Who's there? I called out, my voice sounding braver than I felt. No response, just the steady thrum of the insects outside. I waited a few minutes, listening, but the tapping didn't come again. Figured it was just my tired mind playing tricks on me. I lay back down, trying to get comfortable. That's when I heard it again. Tap, tap, tap. Louder this time, right next to my head. I froze, my pulse pounding in my ears. Someone was definitely out there. I fumbled for the flashlight I kept by the seat and flicked it on, shining the beam toward the window. Nothing. Just darkness and the empty rest area beyond. I took a deep breath, trying to steady myself. Maybe it was an animal, a raccoon or something. But deep down I knew that wasn't it. I reached for my phone, ready to call for help, but remembered I didn't have service out here. Typical. I decided I'd get out of there, drive to the next town, and find a safer place to park. I started the engine, 
the roar of it filling the silence. Just as I was about to pull out, I saw him. A man, standing at the edge of the trees watching me. He was tall, lanky, and his clothes were dirty, like he'd been living in the woods for a while. His face was in shadow, but I could feel his eyes on me. I shifted into gear and hit the gas, my truck lurching forward. As I drove past, I glanced back and saw him moving, running toward the rest area. I didn't stick around to see what he was up to. I kept driving, my hands trembling on the wheel. I made it to Marlinton a little after midnight and found a well-lit truck stop. I parked as close to the building as I could and went inside, my nerves still jangling. The place was almost empty, just a couple of other truckers and the bored-looking cashier. I grabbed a coffee and sat down, trying to shake the image of that man from my mind. What the hell was he doing out there? And why had he been tapping on my truck? As I sat there, another trucker came in, an older guy named Hank I'd seen around a few times. He nodded at me and sat down at the table. Dwight, you look like you've seen a ghost, he said, chuckling. Not a ghost, Hank, I replied, but something close. You ever stop at that rest area up the road? Hank's face darkened. Yeah, once or twice, why? I told him what had happened, and his expression grew more serious with every word. You're lucky, he said when I finished. Real lucky. There's been stories about that place. People disappearing. Bodies found in the woods nearby. They say there's some crazy guy out there, living off the grid. He's been known to attack folks who stop there. A chill ran down my spine. I'd heard stories like that before, but I'd always figured they were just that. Stories. Now, I wasn't so sure. Hank stayed with me for a while, talking and keeping me company until I felt calm enough to sleep. I slept in the cab again, but this time, I made sure to park under the bright lights and kept my doors locked tight. The next morning, I finished my delivery and headed back out on the road. I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched, that the man from the rest area was still out there somewhere. But I didn't see him again. I kept driving, mile after mile, trying to put as much distance between me and that place as possible. I told a few other truckers about it, and they all had similar stories. Strange encounters, eerie feelings, people going missing. In the end, I reported it to the police, but I never heard back. Maybe they found him. Maybe they didn't. All I know is, I never stopped at that rest area again, and I made sure to warn others to do the same. The world's a big place, and there are some things out there you just don't want to mess with. I learned that the hard way. And now, every time I pass a lonely stretch of road, I think about that night and wonder who or what might be waiting in the shadows, getting in. My name is Roy Camden, and this happened to me in the summer of 2003. I was 32 then, driving long hauls for a living. My route took me through the back roads of Idaho, a lot of lonely, open stretches with nothing but mountains and forest. It was a Tuesday, I remember, because I had just delivered a load in Boise and was heading to Missoula with a truck full of building supplies. I was about halfway there when I noticed my fuel gauge dipping low. I planned to stop at a truck stop I knew of, not too far off the main road, just outside a small town called Salmon. It wasn't a big place, more like a diner with a couple of gas pumps out front, but the coffee was good and the folks were friendly enough. When I pulled in, the place looked deserted, not unusual for that time of day. I parked the truck, went inside and called out. No answer. I walked back outside and checked the pumps. Self-serve, thankfully. As I was filling up, an old beat-up pickup pulled in next to me. A guy got out, maybe mid-forties, scruffy beard, looked like he hadn't showered in a week. Hey there, he said, nodding at me. You know if this place is open? Don't seem like it, I replied, glancing around. Haven't seen anyone inside. He shrugged and started filling up his truck. We stood there in silence for a bit, 
the only sound the hum of the pumps and the distant call of a crow. When my tank was full, I waved and climbed back into my cab. As I was about to pull out, I saw the guy waving me down. I rolled down my window. Hey, you headed north? He asked. My truck's been acting up. Think you could give me a lift to the next town? I hesitated. I wasn't in the habit of picking up hitchhikers, but he looked harmless enough. Besides, it was broad daylight, and I was itching to get back on the road. Sure, I said finally. Hop in. He grabbed a small duffel from his truck and climbed into the passenger seat. He introduced himself as Charlie, said he was a drifter just trying to make his way to Canada. We chatted a bit as I drove, mostly small talk about the weather and the state of the roads. He seemed decent enough, but something about him set me on edge. Maybe it was the way he kept looking around, like he was expecting someone to jump out at us. About an hour later, we were deep in the mountains, and I was starting to regret picking him up. Charlie had grown quiet, staring out the window with a strange, distant look in his eyes. I was just about to ask him if everything was all right when he turned to me. You ever seen something you can't explain? He asked, his voice low. I shook my head, keeping my eyes on the road. Can't say that I have. He chuckled, but there was no humor in it. You're lucky then. I didn't respond, just focused on driving. The road was getting twisty, and I needed to concentrate. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw him reach into his duffel and pull out a knife. My heart jumped, but I kept my cool, glancing at him without turning my head. That's a nice knife, I said, trying to keep my voice steady. Where'd you get it? He stared at the blade for a moment, then slid it back into the bag. Family heirloom, he said, his tone flat. The tension in the cab was thick enough to cut with that knife. I kept driving, my mind racing. I needed to get him out of my truck, but we were miles from anywhere, and I didn't want to provoke him. We drove in silence for what felt like hours. Finally, I spotted a rest area up ahead. It was little more than a dirt pull-off with a couple of picnic tables and a trash can, but it was something. I need to stretch my legs, I said, pulling in. You mind? Charlie just nodded, his eyes following my every move. I climbed out of the cab, my legs shaky, and walked over to one of the tables. He got out too, standing by the truck, watching me. I reached into my pocket and pulled out my phone, pretending to check for a signal. Damn, no bars, I muttered. You got a phone. He shook his head. Never had much use for one. I glanced around, hoping to spot another car, a person, anything. But we were alone. I needed a plan, and fast. Then it hit me. Hey, can you check the trailer for me? I asked. I thought I heard something back there. He frowned, suspicious, but nodded and walked toward the back of the truck. As soon as he was out of sight, I bolted. I ran down the road, not caring where it led, just wanting to put as much distance between us as possible. I didn't get far before I heard him shouting. I glanced back and saw him running after me, knife in hand. Panic surged through me and I pushed myself harder, my lungs burning. The road curved ahead and I spotted a small cabin off to the side, half hidden by trees. I veered toward it, hoping to find someone inside. The door was unlocked and I burst in, slamming it behind me. The place was empty, just a single room with a bed, a table, and a stove. I looked around for something to defend myself with and spotted a cast iron skillet on the stove. I grabbed it and crouched behind the table, heart pounding. Moments later the door flew open and Charlie stepped inside. His eyes were wild and he was breathing hard. He didn't see me at first. His attention focused on the door. I took a deep breath, steadied myself, and swung the skillet as hard as I could. It connected with a sickening thud, and he crumpled to the floor. I stood there, panting, staring at his motionless body. I didn't know if he was dead or just unconscious, and I didn't care. I dropped the skillet and ran out the door. I made it back to the truck, climbed in, and sped off, not looking back. I didn't stop until I reached the next town where I found a payphone and called the police. They found Charlie's body in the cabin, knife still clutched in his hand. 
Turns out he was wanted for a string of murders across three states. I was lucky to be alive. That was the last time I picked up a hitchhiker. These days I keep my doors locked and my eyes peeled. You never know who you might run into on those lonely back roads. Life went on after that. But something in me changed. I quit trucking a few years later, settled down in a small town in Montana. Got married, had a couple of kids. But every now and then, when the wind is just right and the nights are quiet, I think about that day. I think about Charlie and that look in his eyes. I never told my wife the whole story, just said I had a close call. No need to scare her with the details. But I keep that skillet in my garage, a reminder of how close I came. It's a funny thing, the stuff that sticks with you. Sometimes I wonder what might have happened if I hadn't stopped at that rest area, if I just kept driving. But then I shake it off. No use dwelling on what ifs. I'm here, and that's what matters. I still drive sometimes, short hauls, nothing too far, and I still stop at those little roadside diners. But I never let my guard down. The world's a different place when you've looked into the eyes of a killer. You learn to see things differently, to appreciate the quiet moments. And when my kids ask why I don't like picking up strangers, I just smile and say, Well, it's a long story. My name is Roy Hunter, and this all went down on September 18, 2006. I was working as a long-haul truck driver, and it was my third run of the week. I've been in the business for over 15 years, seen all kinds of things on the road, but nothing quite like what I'm about to tell you. I was headed towards Lewiston, Idaho, hauling a load of produce from Spokane. It was getting late, and the sun had already dipped below the horizon casting long shadows across the highway. I pulled off at a rest area near Winchester Lake State Park to take a quick break, stretch my legs, and grab a coffee from my thermos. The place was deserted, which wasn't unusual for that time of night. I liked these quiet spots. They gave me a chance to clear my head. As I leaned against the side of my truck, sipping my coffee, I noticed an old, beat-up sedan parked at the far end of the lot. There was something off about it. The windows were tinted so dark I couldn't see inside, and the car seemed out of place. But I didn't think much of it at the time. I had more miles to cover and a schedule to keep. Back on the road, I settled into the rhythm of the drive. The hum of the engine and the steady passing of mile markers were almost hypnotic. After about an hour, I saw headlights in my rearview mirror. They were from that same beat-up sedan. It followed me for miles, maintaining a constant distance. I told myself it was just another driver going in the same direction, but a nagging feeling in my gut told me otherwise. I decided to test my theory. I slowed down, let the car get closer, then sped up again. The sedan mirrored my every move. At this point... My curiosity had turned into unease. I knew I had to do something, so I took the next exit towards a small town called Craigmont. I hoped the driver would just continue on the highway, but no such luck. The sedan followed me off the exit. Craigmont is a tiny place, barely a blip on the map. I drove through the empty streets past darkened houses and closed shops. I finally pulled into the parking lot of a 24-hour diner, figuring it was as good a place as any to confront whoever was tailing me. I grabbed a tire iron from behind my seat, just in case, and stepped out of the cab. The sedan rolled to a stop a few yards away, its engine still running. I walked towards it, keeping the tire iron out of sight. The driver's door opened and a man stepped out. He was tall and lanky, dressed in dark clothes that made him blend into the night. He didn't say a word, just stared at me with cold, empty eyes. There was something about him that sent a chill down my spine, but I kept my cool. "'What's your deal, man?' I called out, trying to sound more confident than I felt. "'Why are you following me?' The guy didn't answer. Instead, he took a step towards me, and I saw the glint of a knife in his hand. Instinct took over. 
I swung the tire iron, connecting with his wrist. The knife clattered to the ground, and the man let out a grunt of pain, but he didn't back down. Instead, he lunged at me, fists swinging. We tussled there in the parking lot, a messy, brutal fight. I managed to land a few good hits, but the guy was relentless. In the chaos, I heard a shout and turned to see a middle-aged woman standing at the diner's entrance, phone in hand, calling the police. My distraction gave the man an opening, and he tackled me to the ground. The next few seconds were a blur of pain and struggle, but somehow I managed to roll free and grab the tire iron again. The sound of sirens in the distance made the guy freeze. He looked at me with a mixture of anger and something else. Fear, maybe before turning and sprinting back to his car. He peeled out of the parking lot just as the first patrol car pulled in. The cops took my statement, but there wasn't much I could tell them. I had no idea who the guy was or why he'd been following me. They assured me they'd keep an eye out for the sedan, but I wasn't holding my breath. People like him, they don't just disappear because the police are looking for them. Shaken but determined to finish my run, I got back on the road. I kept checking my mirrors, half expecting to see those headlights behind me again, but the rest of the night passed without incident. I delivered my load in Lewiston and headed home, still replaying the encounter in my mind. Over the next few weeks, I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched. I'd catch glimpses of that same sedan in my mirrors, always too far away to be sure but close enough to keep me on edge. My wife, Laura, noticed my jumpiness and asked what was wrong. I told her about the guy and the fight, and she insisted I report every sighting to the police. I did, but it felt like shouting into the void. A month later, I was driving through another quiet stretch of highway when I saw him again. This time he wasn't alone. There were two other men with him, standing by the sedan parked on the shoulder. I recognized the lanky frame of the guy who attacked me, and the same cold look in his eyes. My heart pounded in my chest as I drove past, trying to look casual. A few miles down the road I spotted a state trooper parked in a speed trap. I pulled over and flagged him down, explaining what I'd seen. He took off towards the sedan immediately, lights flashing. I followed at a distance, hoping this time they'd catch the guy. When I reached the spot where the sedan had been, it was gone. The trooper was standing by his car, looking frustrated. He told me they'd run the plates I'd managed to remember, but the car was registered to a rental agency. A dead end. I started carrying a gun after that. I'm not a fan of violence, but I wasn't taking any chances. I kept it under the seat, within easy reach. Laura wasn't thrilled about it, but she understood. We both did what we had to do to feel safe. It wasn't until December that things took a darker turn. I was making my way through a snowstorm in Montana, hauling a load to Billings. The snow was coming down thick and fast, making visibility almost zero. I pulled off at a rest stop to wait out the worst of it. The place was empty, just me and the howling wind. As I sat in my cab, sipping coffee and listening to the radio, I saw the sedan again. It was parked at the far end of the lot, barely visible through the snow. My heart sank. I knew there'd be no running this time. I grabbed my gun, checked the chamber, and stepped out into the freezing night. The wind cut through my jacket like a knife, but I barely felt it. My focus was on the sedan. I approached cautiously, gun raised, ready for anything. The driver's door opened and the same man stepped out. This time, he wasn't alone. Two other men emerged from the car, their faces obscured by hoods. They didn't speak, just started walking towards me. Stay back, I shouted, my voice barely carrying over the wind. They didn't stop. I fired a warning shot into the ground, hoping to scare them off. It didn't work. They kept coming. The next few seconds were a blur of movement and noise. I fired again, hitting one of the men in the leg. He went down, screaming. The other two lunged at me, and we fell into the snow, struggling. I managed to get a few hits in, but they overpowered me, knocking the gun from my hand. Just as I thought it was over, headlights cut through the storm. Another trucker had pulled into the rest stop, 
and seeing the commotion, he leaned on his horn, trying to scare off my attackers. It worked. The men hesitated, then turned and fled, dragging their wounded friend with them. The trucker, a big guy named Hank, helped me up and called the cops. By the time they arrived, the sedan was long gone. They took my statement and assured me they'd do everything they could to catch the guys, but I wasn't holding my breath. I'd learned by now that people like them had a way of slipping through the cracks. I took a few days off after that, trying to shake the lingering fear. Laura and I talked about moving, maybe changing my route, but we both knew it wouldn't matter. As long as those men were out there, I'd never feel completely safe. A week later, I got a call from the police. They'd found the sedan abandoned in a ditch covered in blood. No sign of the men who'd been following me. The car was a dead end. Another frustrating twist in a case that seemed to have no resolution. Months passed and life slowly returned to normal. I went back to work, though I was always on edge, always looking over my shoulder. Laura and I took self-defense classes, and I never went anywhere without my gun. One night... I was parked at a truck stop in Wyoming, taking a break from a long haul. I was chatting with another driver, a guy named Mike, when he mentioned something that made my blood run cold. Did you hear about that trucker up in Montana? He asked. Got attacked by a couple of guys in a sedan. They caught one of them, but the others got away. I felt a chill that had nothing to do with the weather. Yeah, I heard, I said, trying to keep my voice steady. What happened to the guy they caught? Mike shrugged. Dunno. Last I heard, he was in the hospital, wouldn't talk to the cops. They think it's part of some gang initiation or something. I nodded, trying to process what I'd just heard. If they'd caught one of the men, maybe there was hope after all. Maybe the police would finally get some answers. It's been a few years now, and I still think about that night in the snowstorm. I never found out what happened to the guy they caught or why they targeted me in the first place. Maybe it was random, maybe it wasn't. I've learned to live with the uncertainty, but the fear never really goes away. Every time I see a beat-up sedan in my mirrors, my heart skips a beat. Every time I pull into a deserted rest stop, I'm on high alert. It's the price I pay for doing what I love, I guess but I'll never forget the terror of that night, and I'll always be ready for whatever comes next. The road is a lonely place, and sometimes it's more dangerous than you could ever imagine. My name is Randall Bergman, and this happened to me on August 13th, 1986. I was a long-haul truck driver, hauling freight across the country. I drove a beat-up Kenworth W900, and my route took me through some of the most desolate parts of the United States. This time, I was headed from Memphis to Albuquerque, a long, lonely stretch of road that I'd driven more times than I cared to count. I'd been on the road for about ten hours and was making good time. The CB radio crackled occasionally with the usual chatter from other truckers, but mostly it was just me and the hum of the engine. I'd planned to stop for the night in a small town called Tucumcari, New Mexico. I liked the place. It had a decent truck stop, and the folks there were friendly enough. The sun was setting, casting long shadows across the flat, arid landscape. i just passed through Amarillo and was pushing on when my truck started acting up. It began with a slight shudder, then a loud bang and before I knew it, I was coasting to the side of the highway. I got out, cursing my luck, and popped the hood. The engine was steaming, and it didn't take long to figure out that my radiator hose had blown. I was stranded. I grabbed my toolbox and flashlight, but I knew it was a lost cause. I didn't have a spare hose, and the nearest town was miles away. I got back in the cab and picked up the CB mic, hoping to catch a friendly voice. Breaker 1-9... This is Roadrunner. Any of you good buddies got your ears on? I'm broke down just west of Amarillo. Over. I waited, but there was nothing but static. I tried again. Still nothing. I sighed and leaned back in my seat. It looked like I was spending the night right there. 
I made myself as comfortable as I could and closed my eyes, hoping to get some rest before dealing with my situation in the morning. I don't know how long I'd been asleep when I heard the knock. It was a light tapping on my window. Groggy, I sat up and looked out, expecting to see another trucker, or maybe a good Samaritan. Instead, I saw a man standing there, silhouetted by the moonlight. He was tall and thin, wearing a dirty baseball cap and a tattered jacket. I rolled down the window just a crack. Can I help you? I asked, trying to keep my voice steady. Need some help? The man replied, his voice raspy. Yeah, my truck's busted. You got a phone or anything? The man shook his head. No phone, but there's a gas station a few miles back. I can give you a ride if you want. Something about him made me uneasy, but I didn't have many options. All right, I said reluctantly. Just let me grab my stuff. I climbed out of the truck, grabbing my flashlight and toolbox. The man watched me with an unsettling intensity. We walked over to his car, an old beat-up sedan that looked like it had seen better days. I got in the passenger seat, and he started the engine. The interior was filthy, and the air reeked of stale cigarette smoke. We drove in silence for a while, the darkness of the desert enveloping us. I kept my hand on my flashlight, ready to use it if things went south. After about ten minutes, I realized we weren't heading back toward Amarillo. The gas station should have been in the other direction. Hey, I said, trying to keep the panic out of my voice. I think you're going the wrong way. The gas station's back that way. The man didn't respond. He just kept driving, his eyes fixed on the road ahead. I could feel my heart pounding in my chest. Something was very wrong. Listen, man, I appreciate the help, but I think I'll just walk back, I said, reaching for the door handle. But before I could pull it, the man locked the doors with a click that echoed through the car. Stay put, he muttered. We're almost there. Almost where? I demanded, trying to keep my voice from shaking. He didn't answer. Instead, he turned off the highway onto a dirt road. The car bumped and jostled as we drove further into the middle of nowhere. My mind was racing, trying to come up with a plan. I could try to overpower him, but he was bigger and probably stronger. I could wait for an opportunity to escape, but who knew when that would come? Finally, the car came to a stop in front of a dilapidated cabin. The windows were boarded up, and the place looked like it hadn't been lived in for years. The man got out and walked around to my side, opening the door. Out, he said, his voice cold. I hesitated, then stepped out of the car, keeping my flashlight close. What is this place? I asked, trying to stall for time. Shut up and move, he growled, shoving me toward the cabin. Inside, the place was even worse. The floor was covered in dust and debris, and the air was thick with the smell of rot. The man pushed me into a corner and tied my hands behind my back with a piece of rope he pulled from his jacket. My mind was racing, trying to figure out a way out of this. Why are you doing this? I asked, my voice trembling despite my best efforts to stay calm. He didn't answer. Instead, he walked over to a table and picked up a rusty knife. My blood ran cold as he approached me, the blade glinting in the dim light. I knew I had to do something and fast. Please, I said, desperation creeping into my voice. I've got money. I can give you whatever you want. The man smirked, the first sign of any emotion I'd seen from him. It's not about money, he said quietly. It's about making you suffer. Before I could react, he lunged at me, the knife slashing through the air. I managed to twist to the side, the blade cutting into my arm instead of my chest. Pain shot through me, but I didn't have time to think about it. I kicked out with my legs, knocking the man off balance. He stumbled back, giving me a moment to act. I struggled to my feet, my hands still bound behind me. I ran for the door, but he was on me in an instant, tackling me to the ground. We grappled, the knife inches from my face. I could feel his hot breath on my skin, the smell of sweat and tobacco overwhelming. With a burst of adrenaline, I managed to roll us over pinning him beneath me. 
I brought my head down hard, smashing it into his nose. He grunted in pain, and I felt his grip on the knife loosen. I wrenched it from his hand and plunged it into his chest. He let out a strangled cry, then went limp. I scrambled to my feet, my heart pounding. Blood was everywhere, and the reality of what I'd just done hit me like a freight train. I had to get out of there. I ran out of the cabin, my hands still bound, and made my way back to the car. I fumbled with the keys, finally managing to unlock the doors. I drove as fast as I could, not daring to look back. I made it to a gas station just outside of Amarillo, my arm throbbing from the wound. I stumbled inside, collapsing onto the floor. The attendant called the police, and within minutes, I was surrounded by flashing lights and sirens. They cut the rope from my wrists and bandaged my arm before taking my statement. The man I killed was identified as Daniel Parker, a drifter with a long history of violence. He'd been linked to several disappearances in the area, and it was clear that I was supposed to be his next victim. The police found the cabin, and inside, they discovered evidence of his other crimes, clothes, personal items, and even a few bones. I was cleared of any wrongdoing, but the experience haunted me. I left trucking a few months later, unable to shake the memories of that night. I moved to a small town in Oregon, far from the highways and the nightmares that plagued me. I never forgot Daniel Parker or the fear I felt in that cabin. Life goes on, they say, but some scars never fully heal. I'm grateful to be alive, but every now and then, I wake up in a cold sweat, the memory of his cold eyes staring into mine. It's a part of me now, a dark chapter in my life that I can't erase. My name is Jasper Holt, and this happened to me on November 12th, 2009. I've been driving trucks for almost 20 years, and I've seen my fair share of weird things on the road, but nothing compares to what happened that night. I was hauling a load of timber from a small mill in northern Idaho to a construction site in Montana. The route took me through some pretty remote areas. No cell service, no towns for miles, just the road, my truck, and the trees. The kind of place where you start thinking about all the horror stories you've heard, but you shrug them off because, well, those things don't happen to you. It was around midnight, and I was somewhere on Highway 12 winding my way through the Lolo National Forest. The night was pitch black, the kind of darkness that swallows up your headlights and makes you wonder if you're still on the road. I was tired, but I had a tight schedule to keep, so I kept driving. I'd been listening to some old country tunes trying to stay awake when I noticed a flickering light up ahead. At first, I thought it might be another truck, but as I got closer, I realized it was a car half off the road, hazards on. I pulled over to see if they needed help. Getting out of the cab, the cold air hit me like a slap. I walked over to the car, a beat-up old Chevy, and saw a woman standing by the hood, looking frantic. Her name was Mary, and she said her car had broken down. She seemed pretty shaken, so I offered to give her a ride to the next town. She hesitated for a moment, but then agreed. I helped her grab a few things from her car and we headed back to my truck. We drove in silence for a while. I could tell she was scared, so I tried to make some small talk, asked her where she was headed, and she said she was on her way to see her sister in Missoula. She didn't say much else, and I didn't press her. I figured she'd had a rough night. About an hour later, I noticed a pair of headlights in my rearview mirror. They seemed to come out of nowhere, and they were getting closer. Fast. I mentioned it to Mary, and she turned around to look. Her face went pale. She told me to drive faster. I didn't ask why. The fear in her eyes was enough. I pushed the pedal down and my rig roared in response. The headlights behind us kept getting closer, and then they started flashing. High beams on and off, blinding me through the mirrors. I could feel the tension in the cab. Mary was breathing hard, and I could hear her muttering under her breath. Just as I was thinking of pulling off the road, the car behind us swerved into the oncoming lane and pulled up alongside me. I caught a glimpse of the driver, a man with a scruffy beard and a baseball cap, 
staring straight ahead, not even looking at us. He kept pace with us for a minute, then dropped back behind my trailer. That's when I heard the first bang. It sounded like a gunshot. Mary screamed, and I ducked instinctively. Another bang followed, and I saw my side mirror shatter. I floored it, my truck groaning under the strain. The car behind us kept up, more shots ringing out. I swerved, trying to make it harder for him to aim, but it was no use. He was relentless. I yelled at Mary to get down, and she curled up in the footwell. I didn't know what else to do but drive. My mind was racing. Who was this guy? Why was he shooting at us? None of it made any sense. Then, without warning, the shot stopped. I glanced in the mirror and saw the car drop back, then disappear into the darkness. I kept driving for a few more miles, my heart pounding, waiting for him to come back. But he didn't. I finally pulled over at a rest stop, my hands shaking as I turned off the engine. Mary was crying, and I felt a surge of anger. Not at her, but at the situation. I got out and checked the damage. Two bullet holes in the trailer, a shattered mirror, and a dented fender. Could have been a lot worse. I called the police on the rest stop's payphone, and we waited. It took them almost an hour to get there. They took our statements, but there wasn't much to tell. No license plate, no clear description of the car or the driver. Just a random act of violence on a lonely stretch of highway. They said they'd keep an eye out, but I could tell they didn't expect to find anything. Mary and I sat in the truck, not saying much. There wasn't much to say. Eventually, I offered to drive her to Missoula, and she accepted. The rest of the trip was uneventful, but the tension never left. Every time I saw headlights behind us, I tensed up, expecting the worst. We reached Missoula just as the sun was coming up. I dropped Mary off at a diner near her sister's place. She thanked me, and I gave her my number, told her to call if she needed anything. She promised she would, but I never heard from her again. I finished my delivery and headed back home, trying to put the whole thing out of my mind. But it wasn't that easy. I kept thinking about that night, about how close we came to dying on that road. I started having trouble sleeping, and every time I got behind the wheel, I felt a knot in my stomach. A few weeks later, I heard about a woman who went missing in Missoula. Her name was Mary, and she was last seen getting into a truck at a rest stop on Highway 12. They found her car abandoned, but no sign of her. The police questioned me, but there wasn't much I could tell them, just a friendly gesture that turned into a nightmare. I quit driving a few months after that, found a job working at a warehouse, something that kept me off the road. I couldn't shake the feeling that it was my fault, that maybe if I'd done something different, Mary would still be alive. I don't know if they ever found the guy who was chasing us. Maybe they did. Maybe they didn't. But I never forgot that night, and I doubt I ever will. Some nights, when I'm lying in bed, I still hear the sound of those gunshots, the shattering glass, Mary's screams, and I wonder if she's out there somewhere, waiting to be found, or if she's just another lost soul, swallowed up by the darkness of that endless road.